My name is Sarah Sims, and we're pleased that you could all join us for this lecture of our volume five of our 12-week No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free, high-quality didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support of the series. Before we start today, I wanna to make sure you're aware of our YouTube channel. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available for your viewing pleasure. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures. Here are our disclaimers for the series. The training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and the YouTube channel later this week. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anita Herrera Hamilton for today's lecture on culturally competent neuropsychological interviewing skills, building your toolkit. As a fourth generation Latinx and Native American, Dr. Anita Herrera Hamilton has devoted much of her career to increasing access to neuropsychological services among underrepresented populations. Ad additionally, she's involved in the mentorship of numerous undergraduate, graduate, and early career professionals. Currently, Dr. Herrera Hamilton is serving as member at large for HNS, a board member for the American Academy of Clinical Neuropsychology, and treasurer for Division 8 of the California Psychological Association. She has recently published on the experiences of equity experienced by Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, BIPOC neuropsychologists. In addition to seeing clients in private practice, Dr. Herrera Hamilton holds assistant professor appointments at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and the University of Southern California and Keck School of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, when I was first asked to speak on this topic, I have to admit, I felt pretty intimidated um, to be the only person presenting on this. So I really do view it as a, um, a cultural competent assessment really is a process for me at least. And so I just, um, I see this more as a discussion. So feel free if people have questions to jump in or put them in the chat and Sarah can direct me to them. But I'm gonna share my um, screen and we'll go ahead and get the lecture started. This takes a couple seconds. Like I wanna say like 20, 20 seconds or so. Okay. All right, so um, like it was mentioned, I'm gonna be presenting on culturally competent neuropsychology, um, interviewing skills. Uh, and this is kind of a, just an informal lecture to think about ways to build your toolkit. Um, there has been, as many of us know, a post-racial reckoning um, in 2021. Then there's been increasing awareness of systemic, systemic racism in healthcare including underrepresentation of BIPOC medical professionals, a lack of awareness in the healthcare services. And while the impact of racism on medicine has received wider attention, there has been less focus on the impact of racism in neuropsychology. And yet the field as a whole has also been slow to respond to the clinical needs of diverse populations, both nationally and internationally. The convergence of colorblind attitudes, neoliberal values, and assumptions of ahistorical scientific neutrality has significantly impacted academic, institutional, programmatic, and administrative aspects of medicine and healthcare. Similarly, inequities have likely been experienced by BIPOC patients and access to subspecialty care for neuropsychological services has also been impacted by BIPOC neuropsychologists and patients alike. Although currently the frequency scale and the impact are relatively unexamined and unclear. Currently, I just wanted to highlight a few of my favorite resources right now. 
Over the past decade, there's been some very exciting voices emerging, providing a conceptual framework and practical elements that guide clinicians and researchers working with culturally diverse clients. These book and other authors and articles provide guidance on culturally informed neuropsychological assessment critical to improving outcomes, reducing healthcare gaps, and reducing diagnostic errors that often occur among ethnic and racial minorities. These projects and the luminaries that drive them highlight the need for practitioners to have the requisite training and how to write culturally informed reports and give feedback to culturally diverse clients. So um, recent controversy surrounding the use of race-based norms among ethno-culturally and linguistically diverse NFL players has highlighted both the complexity of culturally competent neuropsychological assessment and that our most important work lays ahead of us. And it will very likely be determined by early career neuropsychologists, students, and trainees. So um, we're just gonna go over a few um, theoretical models and define some terms before we get started in terms of the overall um, kind of interview toolbox. But as we all know, neuropsychological tests and exam findings are subject to the influence of demographics and social culture factors. And race, as I understand it um, and others, is a social cultural construct that serves as a proxy for many of these crucial factors. So again, just to define some terms, race involves shared physical characteristics and ethnicity involves shared cultural and national identity. So um, I joke that back when I was a trainee, many, many years ago, uh, there was an emphasis on cultural competence and assessment, but it was largely um, a binary view, most often described or categorized as kind of East versus West um, mentalities or worldviews. And some of the themes most commonly discussed were um, cultures that are group-based versus individualistic cultures, um, cultures in which their trust um, is more important than um, uh, being rule focused. And, and then compromising is uh, valued, but in other cultures, confronting um, is more common, it's more the norm. And then some cultures uh, recommend, or not recommend, but um, value flexibility, while other cultures uh, value reasoning and logic. And while this was helpful, it was um, a, a bit rote. And uh, as we think about cultures, they're so diverse that there is a lot of difference within culture and subcultures as we're more aware. So um, more recently, the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and others have provided intersectional models that only not only describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect, but how intersectional identities and attitudes inform power, equity, privilege, and aspects of inequity, both individualistic and systemic. So as psychologists and neuropsychologists, we consider how intersectional identities impact behavior. Um, more specifically as neuropsychologists, we also consider how environmental factors not only impact ethnicity, but there is increasing research to clarify the role of the environment in brain structure and functioning, as well as ability. Um, they also, uh, environment can also inform disease processes and aging processes. And the result is a complex interplay of factors relevant to telling the brain story of our patient. Traditionally, in terms of maybe the last, um, well, since the inception of neuropsychology and up until, you know, my training, probably in the late um, 1900s, early 2000s, 
There has been an emphasis in neuropsychology on disease process, on brain structure, function, and stage of development, and that's all appropriate. But there's been increasing attention um, looking at environmental factors that have been assumed to be less important. Um, in many cases, cultural competence within the field of neuropsychology has often been just kind of tacked on. And yet we're now coming to realize that the absence of culturally competent expertise in assessment can be contributing to misdiagnosis, um, such as over pathologizing, and even contributing to inequitable access, such as lack of measures, and can undermine the growth and development, not only of our patients, but of our field overall. And you know, I, I don't say this to be over negative as much as to highlight the importance of intersectional voices um, and for the leaders in our field to make space for these voices. I wanted to just, um, my head is blocking the term empathy. <laughs> so I'll just move a little bit because it's a key point. I don't know how to do this. Okay. There um, are elements, elements that unify us as humans. And these are values that we experience and that we demonstrate across cultures. It's important that we recognize that we naturally project our values onto others, including our patients. So the reason I highlighted empathy is because it's actually not one of the values mentioned. And there's been um, more recent work, I cite it in the, and it's mentioned in the citations at the end, that empathy is viewed very differently across and within cultures. Um, it's also viewed very differently, but within generations and families and cohorts. And yet empathy for us as psychologists and neuropsychologists, empathy is a tool um, that we often use to increase and sustain rapport. And in assessment, within the context of assessment, we don't get that much time to establish rapport. Sometimes, you know, when I'm working with my patients, I've got about a good five minutes before I have to jump in and get them to commit to about five hours of testing. So every second counts. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that empathy overall can be a bit of an assumption and something we project. We project that maybe the patient desires empathy or that we're assuming that once, um, uh, or that when, when we're empathetic, we're maybe assuming um, one's feelings. We're trying to be empathetic and we're assuming, oh, this person is sad or this person is depressed or this person is content. Um, and just recognizing that our act of empathy is informed to a certain degree by assumptions and projections. And these might be feelings that our patients may or may not have. Um, and so it's important that we just have insight into that. And um, we can also assume that insight is something that everybody values. Um, and we tend to associate a psychologist insight with health, um, but that's not always the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so just some um, familiar terms in terms of neuropsychological assessment. I have to talk about how, um, when I'm writing a report, I'm telling a brain story. And um, the key things that I use to rely on that, everybody will most commonly thinks of the neurocognitive data, but um, as we all know, the history is just as important. Additionally, our behavioral observations, I often kind of joke with my, our trainees that, you know, that's kind of why we still have a job. That's why don't we don't just give somebody a tablet and run them through a bunch of, of tests um, because our expertise, our behavioral observations um, are at the heart of case conceptualization. They anchor um, our findings um, as well as our diagnoses and our recommendations. But I'm here today because central to history is clinical interview. So clinical interview, I think of it as a skill that we develop over time. Um, we learn how to ask questions. Um, we learn to, and this is going to sound more psychological, but we learn to be present. And the longer I'm a neuropsychologist and a person, a human on this planet, and I guess that's one of my values is to be present. But my presence, not just my attention, 
I can attend to something, but my actual joining with the person I'm interviewing and simultaneously listening to them, listening to my gut and thinking about how their words guide my next question. So we're listening to our patient. We're developing our case conceptualization or a differential diagnosis. Um, and there can be elements of one story, their experience or history that um, change how we interpret documents um, or they expose our assumptions. And that's kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. But when we're thinking about clin in clinical interview, it's always helpful for me to look at the documentation that I have before beforehand, the medical documentation, anything. Um, usually we have a background information sheet that either our patient will fill out, a spouse or a, um, a parent, as well as any developmental history. Sometimes that's captured in previous evaluations. And most of the time, evaluations don't come to us a priori before we see the, the patient. So, but we always ask, are there other um, evaluations? And we ask about development. We ask about education and occupation. So as much as possible, it's nice to kind of review the information that you already have so that you can ask informed questions. But that's not the whole that's, that's not deterministic or formulaic. We're not only asking questions based on the information that we have about the patient, we're also listening to how they're telling us information. And that information guides then how our follow up questions. And sometimes those follow up questions, things that we weren't quite sure we were going to ever ask, or maybe didn't think about asking beforehand, we ask and it, it changes or illuminates um, our thinking and our case conceptualization. So one of my well-loved mentors told me during internship, we're psychologists first. And going back to the longer I'm a neuropsychologist, um, I still believe the more important this statement becomes. Um, I feel like I am the ultimate instrument when I'm with a patient, I'm listening to them. I'm absorbing what they're telling me verbally and non-verbally. I'm simultaneously trying to impart openness and authentic authenticity. And I really encourage authenticity. And I'll, I'll often talk to trainees about, you know, I didn't intend to go in to specialize in pediatrics. I don't, I didn't really enjoy children. I do, I do more, but I was really drawn to the maturing brain. And I thought in order to work with kids, you know, I had to talk in a really high voice and be gentle all the time and sweet all the time. And if you've ever been trained by me, you probably know I'm not sweet all the time. Um, I'm very direct, but I found in working with children that really what they valued, and this I think applies to all humans, is just authenticity. It's attractive when we are comfortably within ourselves. And that becomes the basis for connecting with others and establishing a foundation of trust. Um, so I, I really rely on openness, authenticity. It's also important to have integrity in our work, to work hard, to be humble, um, and also to serve. And we're going to talk about some of those elements and how they fit into a culturally competent assessment. If they fit into all assessment, but we're gonna kind of get into some of the, the aspects of that. Um, so for me, since um, I view myself not only as a neuropsychologist, but a psychologist, one of the anchors um, in cultural competence is the APA multicultural guidelines. So for today, I thought I'd kind of review each guideline then illustrate how, through examples of clinical interviews, how um, clinical interview informs culturally competent assessment. And just to be clear, the PHI has been removed or slightly changed. Although even though that's happened, I do ask that we respect the dignity and the confidentiality of those involved in these cases. Um, and that this is only used um, for case for uh, training purposes. Okay. 
So the first guideline, psychologists seek to recognize and understand that identity and self-definition are fluid and complex and that the interaction between the two is dynamic. To this end, psychologists appreciate that intersectionality is shaped by the multiplicity of the individual social context. So first I wanna talk about a 16 year old white male. He was referred by his parents for um, attention concerns. They wanted to know if he had ADHD due to failing grades. Um, and just so you know, this is noted that um, this is pre-COVID. Uh, so parents had described uh, the patient as typically developing male history of good grades. There was no head injury or neurological conditions. Parents denied any family or social stressors. Patient arrived with a parent during initial discussion. Parent remarked with approval that I had graduated from Fuller, which is a um, Fuller School of Psychology, has um, uh, is affiliated with a seminary. And so they said, oh, you went to Fuller. And you know, they said, that's great. We really love that school. Um, there are elements about the interaction that led me to inquire about the patients and the family's religious worldviews. Um, because as the parents were talking about Fuller and then they started to talk about church, they noticed that the patient started to retreat. And so um, during clinical interview, when I was, um, and I should probably also mention that I do a, a formal clinical interview, but when I'm working with patients and we're talking about just life in general, I also view that as um, clinical interview because sometimes some of the, the best pieces of information will come across spontaneously. And again, just being guided by curiosity, openness, um, and looking for information that is going to help me tell the person's brain story. So for example, and this isn't verbatim, but it's just generally how this went. What do you do for fun? I hang out with my friends, other hobbies. Um, oh, like what? I write a blog, Christian Commentary on Social Justice Issues. What's it called? And I continued on, what's your role? And he kind of lit up, he had been a bit flat. And then he said, I asked, what's it like growing up in a Christian community? Well, you know, it's good for the most part. What's good? Um, you were a camp counselor this summer at a summer camp, right? Yeah, I really liked it until. Um, and he was a little hesitant, but he went on to tell me that he had started to want to wear skirts and dresses to school uh, and that his mother um, was very uncomfortable with this. And so she um, took the, the skirts and the dresses from him, but he stole one of hers. And when he was away at a Christian camp, um, he, he wore it, which, def which caused some issues for some of the camp counselors and the campers. Um, and so that piece of the clinical interview was really important. The findings, the neuropsychological findings were average overall. There were symptoms of attention, of, sorry, inattention, but they were related to anxiety and conflict with family, identity development, and individuation from the family of origin. And then the inattention resolved once the patient sought therapy. And I mentioned this one, this is actually, um, I've had many cases that are similar to this kind of um, inattention that emerges uh, in, in mid-adolescence or beyond. And um, it can involve adolescents coming to terms with sexual identity and orientation, but afraid and anxious about disclosing to their family members. And the internalizing anxiety is displaced and shows up in academic performance. That being said, family members may be sending nonverbal cues about resistance to the patient's decisions regarding sexual identity and orientation. Any questions about that case? All right, I'll continue on. I welcome you to um, ask a question either in the chat or uh, verbally. Guide Guideline number two, psychologists aspire to recognize and understand 
that as cultural beings, they hold attitudes and beliefs that can influence their perceptions of and interactions with others, as well as their clinical and empirical conceptualizations. As such, psychologists strive to move beyond conceptualizations rooted in categorical assumptions, bias, and or formulations based on limited knowledge about individuals and communities. All right, so this next case uh, involves a 56 year old white male involved in a motor vehicle accident two years prior. The Glasgow normal uh, coma scale was 15 out of 15. So he was alert when he presented to the emergency department. There was normal neuroimaging. There was no amnesia, no loss of consciousness. Two years later, the patient was unable to return to work due to fatigue. Um, a little bit of history, the patient was born in a European country and reportedly spoke five different languages. Uh, they relocated to the States after marrying. Um, they were currently divorcing. And stressors, um, they were a single parent. Um, that should probably say father, not mother. A stressful job with constant deadlines, no self-care, um, there was no exercise, they weren't exercising, um, they were stress eating and um, reported poor sleep. Okay, so again, this uh, culture dominant white male. Um, one of my assumptions is that, actually, I'm gonna go back for just a second because I wanted to highlight something was brewing. <laughs> That's why I have that coffee picture there. Um, and that was my bias. And some of my bias had to do with, okay, this is um, not a, you know, a, a culturally relevant case, uh, they're culture dominant. Uh, and also there's not a lot of support for a brain injury. So while my bias was impinging upon my case conceptualization and um, kind of assumptions that this patient was kind of milking it that they weren't, they were maybe going to seek litigation and they wanted the um, report maybe uh, to see if they could use this to get some kind of monetary settlement. So we're talking during the clinical interview and this is, I think this occurred actually in between tasks. So I said, so what's it like um, growing up in his country of origin? Um, and he said, I grew up in a rural area. We speak a dialect of German. Uh, your family and community speak meaning they speak the dialect? Yes. Uh, do you live with, did you live with both your parents? Oh, yes. Any brothers and sisters? Two sisters. One died in a motor vehicle accident when I was young. And as we continue to talk and I tested them, um, I was able to identify that unresolved grief um, was triggered by the more recent motor vehicle accident. Uh, there were emotional blockages and psychic pain that were populating into physical symptoms like fatigue, headache, dizziness, um, non-specific symptoms that were being associated with concussion. Symptoms were compounded by current stressors. So I responded, not in that moment. I think I circled back about maybe after the next task or down the road a little bit, but I said, thank you for telling me about your sister. It sounds hard for you and for your family. Do you think your recent MVA stirred up any feelings related to your sister's accident and death? They responded, oh yes, it took me right back to that time. And now my mother and sister, my other sister both have cancer. So it's been a very hard time for me. So I brought this up because um, I find that when it's been a process, but when I'm working on cases where there's somatization, it kind of triggers for me some, um, so, some kind of subtle uh, negativity. Uh, and as a neuropsychologist, I kind of get disappointed because I'm thinking, oh, this isn't real brain injury. But, you know, I've tried to work on being more compassionate and understanding. And um, in doing so, I started to see that somatization, first of all, just because there's somatization doesn't mean there isn't brain injury. And that's the other thing I find that the two can coexist and that will often inform the case conceptualization. Um, somatization differs across generations, across cultures and subcultures, but it can also be adaptive. Um, 
so even though I asked and, and connected the current MBA to the loss and grief, I wanted to also emphasize that within the context of assessment, you can, you can ask a question, but you don't want to enter into a therapeutic conversation. So it's a good question, but it's also helpful to be an ongoing discussion therapeutically. So I asked, would you like me to provide you with referrals? Do you want to go to psychotherapy? Um, and trying to be empathetic, uh, but and still stay on track in terms of the assessment goals. And so saying something like, um, because sometimes a lot of times patients will ask me, do you do psychotherapy? And I do on a limited basis, but I didn't get the sense that this was going to be a good, I was going to be the right specialist for him psychotherapeutically. But I also don't want the patient to internalize any rejection. Again, I'm assuming that maybe that's possible. Maybe they will get their feelings hurt. Maybe they won't, but I'm, I'm entertaining that as a possibility. And so I have my kind of script that I will usually say, I'll say assessment is my subspecialty, but I'm happy to provide you with a few referrals. So a couple of things, um, if the patient is fragile and that they're sensitive to rejection, I'm making sure that I'm affirming them and their needs, but also I'm not just suggesting therapy and then moving on to neuropsychology that I'm um, providing them with referrals that will tee them up for the treatment that they need. Okay, guideline number three. Um, I'm going to speed through because there's a lot of guideline number three, and it's not because it's not important. It's actually one of the most important ones, but when we talk about culturally competent assessment, there's a lot of information around language and fluency. Um, and so I think that other talks will probably inform that, but the slides are here. And I also wanted to mention, if you're interested in the slides or interested in the citations, please let me know. I'd be happy to share any and all of this information with you. So psychologists strive to recognize and understand the role of language and communication through engagement that is sensitive to the lived experience of the individual, couple, family, group, community, or organizations with whom they interact. Psychologists also seek to understand how they bring their own language and communication to these interactions. So that's what I kind of wanted to um, highlight right now. Um, when we talk about communication, in terms of connecting with patients that are similar or different to me, I always like to start with a common ground and this is pretty common sense, but I also think it's important and I've, I integrate it into almost every assessment. The communication starts with, I go out and I get my patients myself. And I feel like across cultures, that's comforting to my patients. Um, I used to have my patients roomed and I think it just, it depends on the, um, the setting. Uh, in terms of communication, though, I like to start the communication on the walking back, and it's a very useful time because I like to start with a common ground. So I'll ask, oh, where are you coming in from? And they'll tell me what city. And then I, you know, it's very common in Los Angeles to talk about culture. That's a very bonding dynamic, actually, in the human experience in Southern Cal California, which is traffic. And we'll talk about how that was navigated. And I like to start with what did you have for breakfast? A lot of that will just tell me a lot about their morning, what they're eating. Um, it really helps connect just in a common ground way. I'm a human, you're a human. And that I think helps break down some of the barriers. So I really like my walk back with my patients in the hallway. Um, it also diffuses, I think, some of the uh, power differential. So I like to leverage that. Um, the other thing, I love to offer my patients and we, you know, we have this, so we have kind of a common area where there's coffee, tea, water. And I just like to point that out and ask if I can get them anything. And again, I just, in terms of communication and connection and team your clinical interview up for honesty and transparency, where you're going to glean helpful information. I think it's very, very helpful. I also find it helpful to mirror language, mirror terms, um, search for bicultural interests. Um, 
media activities, food, um, sports, and avoid idioms. Okay. So a good starting point in terms of um, language and ethnicity is thinking about how you endure. I always ask, um, how do you endorse your race and ethnicity? So it won't be kind of right out the gate, but at some time during our conversation, I will ask. Um, if I'm working with kids, I'll ask parents, um, how do you endorse your child's race and ethnicity or your family race and ethnicity? Um, I will ask parents, um, but I will also ask uh, adolescents, how do you endorse your gender? What pronouns do you prefer? And um, I just encourage people to practice use of they and them. And that probably sounds very commonplace now to a lot of early career trainees, but um, I, it's something I've actually had to practice so that I can use it. I, I don't think I'm quite there yet, but I can use it as easily as more traditional pronouns. And it can really go a long way if you're working with a client that is, uh, prefers they, them, and having, having that as a skill that you can just roll that out, um, I think is really, really helpful in establishing rapport, sustaining rapport, and ensuring that you get great information from the clinical interview. Okay. Um, I wanted to just highlight very quickly, and I think I'll have you all um, maybe read this while I talk, but um, when, when I was being trained, um, the emphasis was on language fluency, and that is a very, very appropriate. But as I've worked with patients, I've often found that sometimes patients will over-endorse their fluency. Um, and again, this is my clinical experience, but that they're afraid that if they're assigned a provider just based on language, that they may not get the best services needed. Now I have had other clients that have said, oh, I speak a certain language. I really need somebody that speaks the same language or the same dialect that I do. But I kind of wanted to highlight this because I, I don't hear about it as much. Um, and so this uh, happened um, this past year, this conversation where I, I told, uh, a mother of a child who um, was struggling possibly with global developmental impairment or maybe a diagnosis of autism. So I, I told her through a friend and it was just on the phone. And, and I guess the other thing is sometimes clinical interview starts the first time you speak with somebody over the phone. So um, I was speaking with um, the mother was listening, but a family friend was interpreting. And I said, I need to refer for you and your child to a bilingual therapist. And they said, I don't want to just go to a bilingual therapist. I want a good therapist. Um, and I, as I was mentioning, sometimes parents and patients won't endorse fluency because they perceive um, that they won't receive a competent provider. And so um, I had to kind of get more specific, since I don't speak Vietnamese, I need to refer you to a neuropsychologist fluent in Vietnamese. I can interpret, um, and the, the family friend said, I can interpret, plus the child doesn't speak anyway. Um, so I responded, this is really kind of you to offer. Um, but I can see, and I can see from your point of view that this is a solution. To ensure that the data collected is valid and accurate, the assessment needs to be conducted by someone fluent in the child's primary language. You're seeking an assessment to request ABA services for your child, correct? And they said, yes. And I said, the reviewers, the people that were reviewing the report to grant your child services have standards or requirements regarding the types of tests used and the standardization or the validity of the assessment if the test data is not considered valid, they will not accept it. And then the child won't get services. So I gave them um, some referrals. They called me back. The people we referred don't do neuropsych. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. I, I gave them um, the name of somebody and then their response was, well, we don't do neuropsych. So I felt really bad. 
I, um, and was afraid that I jeopardized the rapport that I had with them. So I called another provider and they gave me the name of another service provider, but I told the patient's family to keep calling me until they found a neuropsychologist. And again, I think that, you know, part of our role and using clinical interview is to get patients to a safe harbor. We can't always do that, but um, really making a genuine effort and keeping those lines of communication open. So, um, so uh, the, the client, the patient will get ultimately what they need. Okay, I'm going to um, just quickly go through these slides, just highlight some terms about BICS, basic interpersonal communication skills and CALP, cognitive academic language fluency, um, some few things emerging in the literature, children, um, immigrant children who often acquire peer appropriate conversation within two years can take five to 10 years to catch up academically. And in mainstream classes, minimal support for academic language development. Um, it's, uh, it's often assumed that um, language is at the expected level. And so when it isn't, the child can get, is at risk of being misdiagnosed with a learning disability or with low cognitive intelligence. Okay, um, there's a lot of literature on bilingual education for children with language impairments. So I'm gonna kind of skip over that. Um, I just wanna highlight that for you to take a look at. And then for the sake of time, I'm noticing, I'm just gonna speed through. There's 10 of these, but they get shorter. So I'm gonna speed through to guideline number four. Psychologists endeavor to be aware of the role of social and physical environments in the lives of clients, students, research participants, and consultees. So I wanna talk about um, a six year old black male that I saw several years ago. Mom was single, aunt was unemployed and providing um, the majority of childcare. There was infrequent contact with father. Father was um, in another state, possibly had a history of ADHD, undiagnosed ADHD. Mom, mother said the child can't read. Um, he participated in a regular classroom setting and the child was characterized by the teachers, by his teachers as oppositional. During our clinical interview, there were a few pieces of information that were a bit more surprising to me. And I, I humbly admit that because I did have, I was genuinely surprised. The mother had a PhD. She was a small, successful small business owner. She was living in a, an, another state, but it moved to California to relocate to a more equitable environment. She was um, really alarmed by some of the inequities that she had experienced and was hoping to um, move to a state where, she, where her child wouldn't experience those same inequities. The aunt uh, ran a successful jewelry business, but gave it up to help her nephew. Um, and they said, he won't sit still when um, I read. He avoids reading. He also has a friend with a diagnosis of dyslexia, which was a very interesting because the, um, the friendship was informing how engaged the child was. Also, the child was in a dual immersion program. So their primary language was English. They had started learning Spanish for a couple of years. And the rule questioning that he was demonstrating in the classroom, he wasn't demonstrating at home, but the rule questioning really wasn't that oppositional when we started talking about it. Um, so I, I wanted to go on just to add that I did end up testing him and he actually tested in the gifted range. Um, he was being tested uh, for reading in Spanish um, rather than English. And so when we did additional testing in English, his reading was fine. So um, there were just probably the risk of making a lot of assumptions. And I'm... Um, it really, I feel like that case really taught me to not think about the next thing. I talked about being present. You've got a lot to do. That I might have to do reading testing or testing to see if they have dyslexia and I might have to look at spelling and reading and really just kind of luxuriate, luxuriating in the clinical interview, being present and letting that guide my next question. And it uncovered some really important pieces that helped shade and influence how I conceptualize the cases. 
Okay, in terms of guideline number five, psychologists aspire to recognize and understand historical and contemporary experiences with power, privilege, and oppression. So the next case is a 17 year old elite athlete. Um, they saw me for their third concussion. Um, they were out of school for almost a year. Um, they had debilitating symptoms and daily migraines. This athlete was very guarded during testing. Um, building rapport was slow and the, um, the clinical interview was mostly at the end. The sports history they had played since they were four years old, parents were very involved. They moved to a high school from the East Coast um, so they could be recruited. There was lots of pressure, lots of overuse injuries and lots of athletic and academic pressure. Um, there's a process that I find, I work with, when I do, I said, I mentioned I do therapy. So I'm increasingly doing more and more therapy with athletes um, and more and more uh, D1 college athletes because during this time in athletic, um, the academic, I'm sorry, the athletic uh, career, there's an important individuation process. Really successful athletes are so good at skill development and compliance. But then as they become young adult athletes, they have to navigate their career on their own terms. And so this athlete was navigating that and hitting up against some conflict with their parent. So I said, that sounds really hard. What do you want? I want to retire. I want to quit soccer for a long time. I've wanted to quit soccer for a long time, but my parents won't let me. I faked my last concussion just so I could stop. Um, and she went on to tell me that she at times had felt suicidal, um, that she didn't want to tell her parents this, um, uh, but we did discuss retirement and opened up the conversation. And I encourage parents to be supportive of this process of athletic individuation. The sooner the athlete kind of figures this out, the sooner they can decide, do I want to return to the sport or not on their own terms? Silence is information. Um, Silence often tells us a lot, it can be a crucial part of the clinical interview. And I've seen patients that have um, uh, immigrant status. Um, I'm reminded of a 10 year old that I saw many years ago. Um, and it was the interpreter that clued me in and, and I couldn't get the child to speak to me. I could barely get the parents to speak to me. And it was a translator who said, the parents are afraid that anything they say that you'll report their family and their family will be deported. So um, I really worked on trying to gain, gain the trust of the mom um, for, through a longer interview. Um, but then the mom, when I did have some trust, she also went on to tell me that this child had a history of sexual abuse, which also explained some of the silence um, that I was encountering by the child. Guideline number six, psychologists seek to promote culturally adaptive interventions and advocacy within and across symptom systems, including prevention, early intervention, and recovery. So look for clues in the interview about truly helpful recommendations and interventions. Encourage behavioral intervention ASAP. If I know I'm going to refer a patient for psychotherapy, I don't wait until the report is done to provide resources. I usually give that to them. Sometimes I'll give it to them before they even come in, especially if they're waiting a month to see me so we can get the ball rolling. And providing culturally appropriate mental health professionals um, or referrals to mental health professionals can really go a long way in establishing rapport and collecting clean data. Okay, um, being non-judgmental. So um, I was working with an adolescent that was actually uh, failing their classes, but they tested in the gifted range and their father had been struggling with high functioning alcoholism. And it took me um, a little bit of time, but the adolescent did finally open up. And when I met with the father, I initially the father wouldn't meet with me, but um, I did get surveys. And then I said, I really want to meet with you. And I didn't start with um, the father's uh, current functioning uh, we started talking about his childhood. He had a successful business and he had um, experienced significant amount of generational trauma. And he had really, um, he had come out of a war-torn country. He had found his way to California. He had started a business. Um, and so what I was 
able to do while talking to him, um, I punctuated that the child was very smart and gifted and I reassured, which reassured him that I saw him also as high functioning and smart as an, and intelligent and not just as a successful laborer. Um, and then I addressed the real issue and we talked about how his alcohol intake, we talked about the role of alcohol in his family. And I really tried to watch the judgmental language, but just to be authentic. And um, he did say that he would uh, go to rehab. He would get involved. And um, at that point we invited his wife in for the conversation and I made some referrals and I did follow up and ask primarily to see how the patient that I saw was doing um, but was able to ask. And evidently he did follow through with rehab. So um, hopefully the whole family is doing better. Just a couple more um, in terms of guidelines, psychologists or assumptions, psychologists endeavor to examine the profession's assumptions and practices within an international context. And so I love this um, kind of picture, which it changes depending on what angle you're looking at. Um, and I find that that's really true of clinical interview, influenced by openness, um, curiosity, the ability to really connect with a person in the moment. And so some of my assumptions through clinical cases um, that I've talked about today, that inattention is um, pathology, um, that oppositional behavior uh, can be, is often a function of low intelligence, and that oppositional behavior is acultural, that elite athletes are happy, successful people are happy, that cancer or a brain lesion is a patient's biggest problem. And I've met with patients that, um, like the one I mentioned earlier, that um, had had a loss, um, had been sexually abused. I've had others whose um, siblings had been killed recently in drive-by shootings. So, um, my other assumption was that silence isn't useful, that I'm doing something wrong or something isn't going right in the assessment if there's silence. And I think the most helpful assumption for me is that I'm safe and helpful. And that's not always the experience. I feel like I'm safe and helpful and I'm trying to be safe and helpful, but sometimes parents think that I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna judge their parenting. Um, kids are, gonna, um, are afraid that I'm gonna diagnose them as being dumb or stupid that um, my very presence in their life is going to undermine their freedom or their happiness in some way. So um, age and social development, I will, so psychologists seek awareness and understanding of how developmental stages and life transitions intersect with larger biopsychosocial, biosocial cultural context. So I'm gonna talk briefly, oh, wait, let's see. I think I was just didn't make a slide for this because it was just a conversation over the entire assessment. Um, but it had to do with um, a 56 year old um, left-handed male. And the testing revealed that he likely had an undiagnosed dyslexia. He had grown up being marginalized as being left-handed. So he was taught to use his right hand and that impacted his uh, academic academic work output significantly. Um, and that he, because he wasn't successful in school, he had created the, this kind of entrenched adaptive anxiety, um, kind of that his brain didn't work right. And so as he matured and developed, he was very anxious and he was referred to me for cognitive impairment, so stated. And so we actually talked about how he likely had an undiagnosed dyslexia. And I was able to, him to show that some of his nonverbal findings were really well above average to gifted. And it changed his, the framework in which he embedded his identity and sense of confidence. And then we referred him for psychotherapy and he saw very six, um, a psychotherapist that um, was a trainee of mine and they did great work together. Um, and we were able to help him kind of reframe his identity, quell his anxiety and um, function at a higher level.
So just to wrap up, we strive. Guideline number nine, psychologists strive to conduct culturally appropriate and informed research. And just, the, I love the word strive because it implies a process. This is always a process that we're using. Um, it's an infinite process. We're learning, um, we're checking ourselves, we're talking to others, we're striving uh, to be better service providers, uh, better neuropsychologists, better psychologists, better humans. So this is just one of the frameworks that involves, I think I just mentioned, um, the layered ecological model of multicultural guidelines. So it's illustrated here. And then um, guideline number 10, psychologists actively strive to take a strengths-based approach. So don't just look for the pathology. <laughs> I remember being in my early career, I loved ring cutting and I lived from ring cutting. Uh, basically, I would love to go. Uh, but I also realized that um, sometimes I would only acknowledge the pathology and not acknowledge the strengths, um, or sometimes think that only low scores had to do with weakness or dysfunction. And as I regularly say, you can get low numbers for any number of reasons. So um, also look for the things that are working right, as, as well as the things that are struggles or deficits. So in conclusion, um, we do want to think about culturally competent interventions, um, and but we also want to overlay that with integrity and ethics and expertise. And so my, my encouragement is always just to stay open and authentic, to be humble, to be brave and advocate for your patients. Tell the truth. There are hard, hard conversations, hard questions to be asked some hard content to listen to. And if it makes us uncomfortable, we kind of need to examine that and don't pull our punches in the clinical interview, but really engage and ask the questions that need to be asked, to be honest, to keep learning, to keep striving, um, and then to continue to collaborate. And I'm really looking forward to this next part. I know there isn't that many much time left, but I would love to hear from you all and hear what's working and what's not working. And feel free at any time to reach out to me um, and continue this discussion and conversation. Okay. Thank you so much. And we had a comment um, from someone that says, so helpful um, for someone like yourself, a clinician to model challenging their own assumptions. Um, and so thank you so much for that presentation. I think it was really inspiring. We also had a question um, that I think we can cover before our time is up. Um, so what are some checks you have for yourself when noticing your biases are brewing in case conceptualization or in the moment with a client? Mm -hmm. um, being grumpy. <laughs> when I notice in my body that I'm irritated or annoyed or I have my brain in the future, um, I really live when I'm with a patient to try and be no, not have my brain be in the present. So, um, and I look for physical cues. I can feel it in my shoulders. I can feel it in my neck. Um, when I am not present and when I'm not joining, then I'm not really absorbing the information I need to absorb. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Really noticing our own reactions to things um, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, just another quick question. How can trainees gain experience with culturally informed interviews or what steps should they take to try to gain this experience, especially if they may not have that formal multicultural training opportunities? So it's going to be messy. <laughs> and hopefully you have um, supervisors that want, want you to dig in and get messy and you know fumble around. And they acknowledge too that they fumble around a bit as well, we all do, we're all trying to understand each other and do the best that we can. So I would say in a safe environment, dive in and be honest and authentic. And the most important thing we can know as neuropsychologists, psychologists is to know what we know, but to know what we don't know and to talk about that. And then the other thing I just wanna mention really quickly is that I have had um, numerous trainees that speak um, one particular that are bilingual or trilingual and they do kind of get pigeonholed into only seeing certain patients because of their fluency and it hinders their training or it impacts the trajectory of their training. And so, um, you know, I had a trainee that 
is Spanish speaking. And she was telling me that at her other side, she was always with the Spanish speaking child, uh, patients, but she loves neuroimaging. I'm like, you need to go hang out with the neuroimagers too. We're like, don't let them just put you where it's useful for them programmatically. Make sure you know what it is you want and that you have rights for your training and your trajectory and to advocate for that. Yeah, that's a great point. And that, that's all the time that we have today. I know there are other questions, but um, I uh, hope you all can, speak in our imaging, I hope you can all join us next week um, on at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be talking about the fundamentals of neuroimaging approaches to cognitive impairment. So thank you so much, Dr. Her Hamilton. It's so great for your presentation. And thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Thank you for having me.